We're talking to Peter Galloway, who's a retired captain of the Royal Navy. Um, th firstly, Peter, thank you for letting us talk to you today. My pleasure. Um, you've got an extensive career, but you've kindly said that you would talk about a very small part of your career, which was the Falklands conflict. So, um, really, I'm just going to ask you to sort of gently speak about what you can recollect and your memories of that, you know, any sort of poignant moments or anything that you feel that the local people would be interested in. Okay. Um... Well, of course, Glamorgan was quite an old ship in 1982, um, and I was a young commander, I was 38, and <clears throat> I hadn't got much experience of this particular type of ship. So I joined in March of 82, which was literally a month before the Argentinians invaded. I had five officers working for me, um, about 17 chief petty officers, 16 petty officers, and the rest were leading hands and below. And we also used to employ about 10 seamen who, who were part of the missile and gunnery teams. So roughly a crew working for on the, the weapons side of about 110 people. So you were the weapons engineer and officer? Correct. Okay. Uh, ship's company was about 540, don't quote me on the exact numbers. Um, the ship, big ship, five and a uh, half thousand tons, 550 feet roughly. Uh, but steel, which comes into the story a bit later, tough ship. We had spent a few weeks uh, testing this and getting ready for a big exercise off Gibraltar, which involved firing missiles at aerial targets and testing our big sea slug missile, which is a two-ton Mark II missile. The ship was uh, built to accommodate 30 of these missiles. And imagine at 60 tons of missiles and they were laid in next to each other all the way down the center line of the ship about 15 to 20 feet above sea level and the significance of that will become apparent later because of the dreaded exocet we knew all about exocet because we had exocet on board we knew the argentinians had exocet and it's an odd missile which was beginning to preoccupy me um, as we found out the Argentinians had invaded. Now the way we found out was quite amusing. Um, I, I mentioned the incident in my book, I don't need to revisit it now, except to say that Admiral Fieldhouse happened to be on board the ship operating off Gibraltar with a lot of Type 42 destroyers and we, we in Glamorgan were doing rather better with our old sea slug than they were with their modern sea dart. So we were pretty pleased. We were shooting down targets and they weren't. Um, um, they had technical problems, but all ships do. So we were quite pleased with ourselves and the Admiral was on board. We found out, in fact, that the Argentinians invaded when his flag lieutenant interrupted the Sunday night film and asked to borrow Jane's fighting ships. And he was uh, whisked off in the helicopter very quickly back to Northwood, and that was the last we saw of him until, would you believe, he came on board when we returned. Even talking about returning makes me sort of well up a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we immediately turned south with the other ships that were going to become part of the task force, and the, the ships that weren't, and there were things like Icara frigates that would be no use down there. They, they had to offload their weapons and their fuel to us. And apparently they had some pretty damned awful trip back to England across the Bay of Biscay because they got rid of so much weight they were bobbing around like a cork. Oh, and, it, and it was a pretty uncomfortable trip back, whereas we were laden with everything. So much ammunition, we had to um, stuff things everywhere all over the ship. Uh, depth charges, bombs, whatever. So off we went uh, south, and of course at this stage we had no Hermes, um, no Invincible. It was just um, a couple of destroyers, Antrim, our sister ship, ourselves, and some frigates. And the idea was to get to Ascension, refuel, regroup, and go down and see what we could do before the carriers arrived. At this point, Admiral um, Woodward was in Antrim, but for some reason he chose to transfer his flag to us in Glamorgan. And <clears throat> I became his staff weapons engineer officer for a few weeks as we transited down south. I remember we had a church service off Ascension, 
on Ascension Day, which was a bit spooky. And um, I'm not too proud to say that I did pray um, <clears throat> for the ship and, and the lads. Um, because I hadn't been on board very long, I didn't know my team very well. And one of the things you've got to do as a leader is you've got to make sure they trust you and you've got to establish how much you can trust them. So it was a bit of a learning curve, basic remembering that we were trying to get ready to fight. And there wasn't a lot of time for anything else except preparing for this, what we thought was going to be a battle. Of course, we also thought that Baggy Thatcher and the Americans would have sorted this out before we got there, so we weren't sure. Uh, it all started for us on the 1st of May, which is the day the Vulcan came down, and I'll never forget the pilot's voice echoing around the ops room, saying he was going low. <clears throat> I'll talk to you in a few hours to, or a couple of hours' time when, he, when I get back. Of course, he'd had something like six refueling stops on the way down, and he still had six more to go back. And We went in uh, that morning um, <clears throat> to attack the airfield at Stanley with two frigates. We were bombed that morning badly. The pilot who attacked us in, I think it was a Skyhawk, he tried to flick the two bombs onto the ship. He attacked us directly from the stern, but he overcorrected and the actual bombs crossed the flight deck and blew up, <coughs> excuse me, underneath the stern. And we became very unstable. And I remember a little squeaky voice in the ops room saying, I think we're going over. And a very deep voice said, no, we're not. Get on with your job, lad. So <coughs> there were some, you know, that was the first moment of humor I remember in war when the lad who was in the tiller flat, where the steering gear is, sitting there all alone, ran, rumbling around at 28 knots, the whole ship shaking and cold and miserable. But that was his job, in case we got hit, was to look after the steering gear. And the bombs went off with it probably within a few feet of the ship's hull, where he was. And the senior engineer phoned him up and said, are you all right, Smith? And if that was his name, I can't remember. And he said, yeah, I'm fine, sir. Is there anything you need? A clean pair of overalls, sir, be useful. <laughs> <laughs> so Jolly Jack was at it already. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we, we escaped. We didn't, you know, get hit by those bombs. From then on, we spent um, a lot of time thinking about the Belgrano. And she had a lot of exocets. And I, as I've said, was a bit worried about Exocet. It's a very powerful weapon. But it can only do one thing, and that's to hit a target that it finds when it's flown about 10 miles of its 20-mile range. And it looks for the first thing it can find it is what it'll hit. It can only fly at three heights above sea level, and they're fixed. I can't remember the exact heights, but we'll say they're 12 feet, 18 feet, and 25 feet, depending on the sea state you don't want to fly it through the waves. <clears throat> so I was worried about Exocet and eventually, and it's a long story, uh, I convinced the captain that the only real way, if we couldn't shoot one down, was to make sure that we didn't take it in the side of the ship. If it came in, penetrated the side of the ship, I was pretty certain that we would disappear, rather like HMS Hood did in the Second World War. It would be a cataclysmic explosion because the sea slug missile, boost missiles, if you touch them with a hammer, not touch them, if you strike them with a hammer, they will detonate. And they were the ones that were, were, were yeah. running along inside your About ship? About 300 feet long magazine and, you know, 60 tonnes of, of missile. Mm -hmm. uh, if the high explosive warhead went off, I mean, the, one of those would, would blow the ship up, let alone 30 of them. So I persuaded the captain after many hours of thought that we would be well advised if we ever saw an Exocet coming towards us to either head it or, or take it on the stern. So we must turn towards or away at speed because if it hit the bow, it probably um, the energy would be taken by the anchors and the cable locker, which is full of tons of big chain, or on the stern with the flash doors for the sea slug missiles, which are four inches thick. And even if it deflected and blew up, 90% of the energy would go up into the air, mm -hmm. not into the ship. 
The Exocet is a horrible missile. It's got some clever technology at the bow which uh, allows it to have 14 milliseconds to try and dig inside the ship and blow up inside, which, of course, is what it did with Sheffield. So I eventually got the captain to see that that was a pretty clever thing to do, and he did instruct all the officers, if they ever saw one, to, to do just that full speed and turn away or towards, whichever was the quickest. Um, we, we then spent weeks and weeks, and we were, we were fighting for seven weeks, except for the last two days. We were hit on the 12th of June. Most of the time we were supporting the army, uh, the Royal Marines, Paris, the Gurkhas, all the guys who were yomping across the islands. So what were you actually doing? You say defend, uh, helping and supporting. What were you actually doing? Right, we would go in um, at about, uh, sort of, shall we say, sort of evening time, and we would support uh, units of the, of the ground forces as they advanced eastwards. There was one night, I remember, um, we would have spotters who would come on board to get brief and they would be spotting for the army ashore. And there was one man who, every time he went on board a ship, it seemed to get sunk. Uh, but, and he came on board us and we thought, oh, here we go, it's our turn. But there was one night where we were supporting the Royal Marine commando who were being pinned down by um, a machine gun unit. And they called for fire, which means they wanted us to take the machine gun out. <clears throat> and we put the first five rounds were in the air. We were standing off about five or six miles away, I think. And <laughs> you can hear his voice echoing around the ops room. And the, the, the little F word came out. You've hit it as though he wasn't expecting us to, which was quite funny. So we check fired on that, and they, you could hear him running with the Royal Marine unit. You could hear him running, and then you could hear him as he hit the ground. Come on, there's another one, and he called for fire on that. And it's quite a complicated process to explain how you fire from a moving ship at a stationary target, which is not at the same height as you, and so on. But it's a very complicated um, system of, of computation. But would you believe we hit the second one with the second round? I mean, it was that quick. And when <clears throat> they got to the third machine gun, he said, the lads want to have a go at this themselves. So <laughs> they obviously had a, a hand portable uh, rocket or something. Um, but we were doing this all the time uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we'd be, sometimes it'd be, it was called the gun line, where you were steaming up and down. Whenever the army got stuck, we'd lay down some rounds. I can't remember the figure. I think we fired one and a half thousand rounds over the weeks. Um, that, was, that was for seven weeks? Yeah. And the, I guess everyone was pretty tired? Yes, there was, there was a bit more to explain, when, when you fired your guns for a little while, uh, we would stay there maybe several hours or sometimes even longer all night. Then we'd make a run for it to the east to refuel, rearm, make sure we always had the uh, ammunition was fully topped up. But the problem was that the sea states were very rough. And <clears throat> when you're doing 28 knots, you get a lot of water comes over the bow and drains, drowns the gun and everything. And you have to take the breech block out of the gun and, and clean it. And the breech block weighs, I'm, I'm guessing, half, a quarter of a ton or something. It's a big bit of kit. It's very dangerous if you have that and the ship's rolling around. So we couldn't always lower the breech while we were going out. and We had to wait until it was relatively calm. So it meant the lads were working all sorts of hours, you know, even when they were off watch. Because, of course, you'd fight at action stations and you, you, when you're at defence watches, half of you are trying to sleep or eat. So if you were off watch and, it was, and then you got an alarm, then you, suddenly you were back on watch. And so yeah. you could do, you could sometimes spend two or three days where you didn't get any sleep. Um, and, but you got used to it and adrenaline kicked in. It was very interesting that nobody was seasick once. Normally in that ship you'd have 20, 30 people suffering in those sea conditions. It was mm. rough. Mm. Not one. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, so it's the 12th of June, you've been in battle for about seven weeks. We'd lost some ships by then, haven't we? Yes, the, the Sheffield had gone, the supply ship, the Atlantic Conveyor had gone with a lot of valuable helicopters and so on on board. Coventry had turned over, bombed, 
Um, one of the frigates had blown up, so it was yeah, it was a bad time. And you were in the thick of this action. Yeah, I mean, obviously we knew exactly what was happening and where, but we also knew the army were doing pretty well. And on the 11th, that night of the 11th and 12th of June, was the big final push for Stanley. We knew we were winning. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we, rather like all the other knights, we'd gone in to support the army in this final push. And we've, we were firing a lot of rounds. And we, we were standing off, we'll say about five miles from Stanley Airfield. I'm, I'm get, I can't remember the exact range, and it doesn't matter, but we were quite aware. We also knew that the um, Argentinians had got Exocet missiles on, would you believe, a farmyard trailer. Um, and we knew exactly where it was. Excuse me. And <clears throat> we therefore had to be clear that we, we didn't enter into the 20 mile radius from this spot on the land. So we were supporting the army, everything was going well, um, until after 13 hours at action stations, and some people had already been on watch for six hours before that, so everyone was tired. We stood down and went back to defence watches. Now I, because of all my kit and I was looking after the missiles, the guns, the computers, the radars, the sonars, the, all the radio sets, a lot of equipment which had been <clears throat> burning and turning for a long time and we want, I wanted to make sure everything was uh, put through its paces to see it was working correctly for whatever was going to happen next. So wh whilst half of the ship went to have breakfast and things like that and have a wash I asked my lads to remain closed up and report back to me when they'd finished the tests, which would probably take 20 minutes or so. What we didn't know was that the Argies had just fired the missile that hit us. The first thing we realised in the ops room where I was, a dark room full of 30, 30 people, um, all the screens, uh, radar screens and so on, was that the bridge suddenly altered course hard to starboard. They had seen a, a light, I should paint the picture a bit better, it's pitch dark, it's six, I think 6.30 something in the morning, and pitch dark, but there's a white light coming from the port quarter, or port side, and I think the navigator and the officer of the watch did exactly what we'd agreed with the captain, we were luckily doing 28 knots, so we were going flat out. And when you put wheel on at that speed, you lean over a long way, and we did. We were probably over, I would guess, 12, 15 degrees when um, we fired a sea cat, which is a very small missile, at this thing, this white light getting bigger. We knew it was going fast, because we didn't know what it was at that point. The missile didn't have time, our missile didn't have time to arm before it passed the Exocet, so it didn't even explode. So therefore, unfortunately, the Exocet did strike us just after the hangar door, port side, and because we were leaning so far over it, it hit the sperm water, which is the top corner of the deck, at an angle, I would guess, of 30 degrees above the beam. So we, were, we, we had almost achieved taking it on the stern, but not quite. But the good news was that at that point, the Exocet tried to get into the ship by digging into the deck for this 14 milliseconds uh, delay, but it couldn't. So it blew up on the upper deck, and most of the energy went into the uh, atmosphere. But unfortunately, the missile rolled over and went straight through the hangar door and blew up the helicopter and blew an enormous hole in the deck into the space below, which was the galley, where unfortunately some of the lads had um, <clears throat> gone to get some breakfast and sort of queuing, and the chefs were down there. So we did suffer a lot of... Okay. Yeah. Um, the, a lot of people were killed, and a lot of people were injured. And we were on fire big time. There was one other weird thing. We suddenly started to take on a, a list to port. 
and we couldn't understand why. Uh, to cut a long story short on that, what had happened was the shock of this detonation of the missile had broken a connection, the fire main, in the big sea slug magazine and tons and tons of water had filled up part of the magazine and of course as soon as it gets into a, sp a large space it tends to either go to the left or to the right, port or starboard, and it had all gone onto the port side. And it took us a little while to work out where, why we were leaning over so much, but eventually um, did some rounds of the magazine, found the water, opened the sluice valves, drained it down into the engine room, and they pumped it off. Oh. And we came back upright, which was a quite a relief. It's not a nice feeling, leaning over. <laughs> uh, the fires were put out, took quite a long time, a lot of smoke damage. The injured were taken to either to the um, wardroom, which was operating as an operating theatre, <coughs> or they were taken to the flight deck to be flown off to Hermes. And um, unfortunately, I had two big two-ton sea slug missiles on the launcher, which is where, right where the helicopters were trying to come in and land. <coughs> there were flames everywhere, and I was worried in case one of these missiles was inadvertently sort of mm. got fire damage and detonated or something. So I asked permission um, of the captain to, to discharge these two missiles somewhere into the bundu, get rid of them. And he said, do it. We were on a safe bearing to get rid of them. Uh, so that was fine. What I didn't know was one of the Chinese laundrymen, who, and we did have five of them on board, he decided it was time to get off the ship. He didn't like the sound of this. So he was literally swimming down two deck, trying through deep water, trying to get out onto the quarter deck and jump off the stern in the dark in a force seven, eight, whatever it was. He wasn't going to live if he got there, but luckily number one Chinese laundryman caught up with him and caught him on the guardrail, on the stern, as we fired these missiles. No man has ever stood within 100 feet of one of these things. He was within 10 feet of it when it went past him. Took all his hair off, all his clothes, and he was as deaf as a post for several days, but he didn't die, thank goodness. And there's a story in the book I wrote about, which is, I'm not going to repeat now, but it's quite funny. But the good news is he recovered his hearing and he was fine. Meanwhile, <coughs> uh, the, the, the dentist and the doctor were busy trying to look after the guys who were injured. And there were some severe injuries, of course. We managed to keep going at 28 knots, which was pretty amazing, but of course there was nothing really wrong with the propulsion and the steering was fine. Um, and as I said, the fires were put out and we headed east at speed to get away from any further attacks from perhaps aircraft and so on. We then uh, transited about 200 miles, I think it was, to the east to the trawler area, which was the tug replenishment and logistics area where there were lots of other ships. And they set about repairing the damage. And <clears throat> one of the damage incidents was the main radar, which controls sea, uh, sea slug missile, had thousands of cables separated by the explosion. They repaired the lot. We you spoke about um, the fact that you felt that quite a lot of time, although everyone was fighting, you felt alone. And you did you, you mentioned about actually when they you got all that support, it really made you yes. quite emotion. Um, you know, it, it made you feel very supported. Yes, I mean it, it's an odd thing, but when you're out to sea, although you know there are other ships around, um, you're a fighting unit. Obviously, you get to know each other really well, and by then I'd begun to get to know my team very well indeed of course but you are alone and we we had our problems technical problems um, and trying to keep a ship of that complexity fighting fit for seven weeks had taken a bit of a strain on us all and to the users you know the people down below in the engine room they've been working flat out the, the seamen manning the missile systems and so on everyone was working hard and when we were told that, you know, the, the war was still on, obviously, and we were told that we had to go out and get repaired, we thought, gosh, this is going to be an impossible task. And suddenly on board came this team. Was there almost like a sense of relief that you could all not switch off, but you just felt for a few... It, for some time, it wasn't just you who yes, had that responsibility. It, it was the team of people who were naval guys who 
I wouldn't say they wanted to be fighting with us, but they were there to help, mm. and my God, they helped us. And yeah. <laughs> it resonated with you. I don't talk about this much, and mm. it seems odd at my age to be emotional, but it was. It was such a difficult time, I suppose, and for that, you must the relief that you know that there are there are those people there who were there to support you and you yeah. and you're and valuing what you were doing and recognizing yeah you guys were doing something that was very very difficult yeah we needed them and of course we were very upset because that night we we buried the the 13 guys who died immediately they were mm. buried at sea about 250 i think it is kilometers to the east of the falklands uh, a very poignant time and, and one other died a bit later unfortunately but uh, it was a tough time yeah but the, the, the Falkland battle war was still going on and we we did eventually get ourselves mended and we were back in action just before the truce on the 14th so we we were the first ship down there and you could say we were the last to leave the, the fighting because we were still we were available to fight uh, eventually when we got fixed up and the, the team on the, the on the um, ships in the trailer were quite amazing they even I remember they gave us steak and egg for <laughs> hmm. okay. I keep thinking of these guys who didn't come back at all yeah which is understandable mm. We, we then spent a few days um, doing some more repairs because we couldn't weld up the hole in the ship whilst we were at sea. So we actually went into Carlos Sound and um, it, was, it was a very funny incident in Carlos. It was the first time we'd all seen San Carlos because you know, we were standing off miles away most of the time. And um, it was a beautiful day and the ship was steady so we were able to weld up the hole and eventually on the 21st of June we said goodbye to Hermes and we came home with HMS Plymouth which had also had damage. Yes it was quite um, sad leaving Hermes down there but the damage we had suffered was pretty pretty bad. One of the problems was that we had to feed the whole ship's company from the wardroom galley. The main galley was destroyed um, and the wardroom was only meant to feed about 40. So we were trying to feed 500 from a galley which was pretty limited. Um, we came back with HMS Plymouth and Plymouth um, was a frigate, much smaller, but she had been bombed and she had terrible damage as well. And it may sound a bit macabre, but on the way back we stopped for a few minutes and swapped, not crews, but 20 of us went over there and 20 of them came over to see us to, to learn some lessons about damage, survival, lessons learned from firefighting and so on. And it was pretty weird walking through the what they call the Armada Way, which is the main passageway through the ship, blackened um, and pretty pretty desolate place but they've they've said the same about our damage you know they couldn't believe we'd survive that exocet they Plymouth decided that they wanted one last run ashore in Gibraltar on the way home before they got to Plymouth we didn't as Jack does yeah but we didn't we, mm -hmm. we, we I don't I don't think we took a vote but it was decided we wanted to get home and see the families um, <clears throat> there were only two emotional Although I've been emotional talking about the, all of this, I felt no emotion during the fighting um, or when we left. It was nothing hit me until a most peculiar event off Portland where a frigate steamed past and cheered ship. And. <coughs> that was very emotional for me. I can remember the tears. It was just mm. what a wonderful sight. Mm. Um, well, Fieldhouse came on board and did one of these gather round chaps and I thought well, here we go another senior officer but he inspired me god I was moved by him mm -hmm. I became a fan of his immediately I'd never met the man before 
Yeah. I'd seen him on board the ship in Gibraltar a few weeks before, but never, um, you know, spoken to him. But I, I became a lifelong fan until, unfortunately, he died. He was a great leader. He was an inspiration, I think, to all, us all. Um, we came in uh, to Portsmouth, a uh, Royal Marine Band on the jetty, thousands of the family there, very emotional. And we came in starboard side too, so that luckily they couldn't see the damage, because that would have been very upsetting for some of the um, relations of the guys who didn't come home. And that was pretty poignant because I heard one of them talking and saying, I just wanted to check you got the name right. Oh dear. So they were probably hoping that we'd made a, they'd made a mistake. Yeah. And he would be there. Yeah. It was weird. Mm. Then we spent a long time um, in Portsmouth getting mended because there was a lot of damage to repair. And meanwhile, look, there were some lovely little stories from the Welsh support because we were um, a Welsh named ship. I think everyone in Wales thought it was full of Welshmen. <laughs> I don't think there were many on board. But there were some amazing moments. I mean, one of the, um, I think it was the Conservative Association in Mumbles had collected quite a bit of money for the South Atlantic Fund and they wanted someone to um, go and get the cheque. My wife and I were sent off because I was the senior surviving officer on board and all the rest had left. So I went up to get the cheque and I met this committee and we had a drink in the bar and he, he, the, the president of the association said, uh, when we go through, um, he said, if you could just keep your talk down to 40 minutes, I think would be enough. Now I had no, no mention of a talk, I thought, what? And he said, there are probably two or 300 people in the room at the moment. I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, I got the check, so I had to do something. So I thought, well, what do you do for 40 minutes? They're obviously expecting a, a dividend. So I decided to try and relive what had happened. And when I finished, um, there was a deadly hush. And <laughs> then I was mobbed, <laughs> mostly by young girls and young women. Um, one of whom I remember was in a leopard skin suit. My wife still remembers and talks about her. Um, but it was the most amazing outpouring by Welsh people trying to support the ship. Yeah. And there are other funny, funny recollections of um, which I won't go into now. But they're in the little book I've written, uh, which may make you smile if you ever pick up the so book. So you mentioned you've written a book. Yeah. Um, What's the reason behind it was that. Um, I've got four grandchildren, and they haven't got a clue what I did in the Navy. Um, and I thought, why not commit some of this? And this book, um, it's called My Bags Are In The Back, and it's got a, a picture of Dartmouth College and a little boy there, that's me, when I was 17, and a very large chief petty officer. And it's called My Bags Are In The Back because um, I arrived at Dartmouth as, uh, shall we say, a slightly precocious ex-public school boy. And I arrived half an hour after the main group had arrived on the London train. I'd come down from the Cotswolds, I was a bit late, got a taxi from the station at Dartmouth up to the college, and the driver said, where do you want to go, sir? And I said, over there with them. He said, I'm not allowed to drive on the parade ground. I said, well, drop me off here, right in front of the mast. And I saw this man coming towards me with a peak cap on and very shiny boots and a stick under his arm. And I thought, that's nice, he's come to open the door. I stepped out <laughs> of the taxi and the door opened backwards and unfortunately hit him in the midriff. And my first words in the Royal Navy were, my bags are in the back, which did not go down well with the chief GI, who was a very important person in the college. And he chased me for the first four weeks of my naval career. Every time I woke up, he was standing there, I'm sure. And I doubled for four weeks. And you're not allowed to go ashore for a, a, the pub for the first four weeks. And when I did, he was in the other bar and he called me in. And I thought, God, even at a pub he's got me. But he bought me a beer because I, he was dining out with his friends about this chap. My bags are in the back. So the book covers the, the 35 years of my career, ending up as the naval advisor or attaché in Delhi, in India. And a lot of it's very funny. Uh, it also includes the most bizarre dinner party we had in India where I had eight Victoria Cross holders to dinner. Oh wow, sounds very interesting. 
it's fun. Great. So you so you live in Gosport and you've lived here for thirty one years. Well, in this house, I mean, we we've lived in Peel Common. We lived in Alverstoke and um, Western Way. We. We had a quarter in South Sea once, mm. and obviously been around and lived all over the place. But this house um, in Alverstoke, we've been here 31, 32 years. So you said that you've, clearly your naval career, you've lived in different places around the world, but you've lived in Gosport a lot. So what is it about Gosport that you love as a family? When we arrived, of course, it was a very different place to live. In those days, Hasler was vibrant mm. and navy not try service um, and or Dryad was a, a very centre of um, seamanship excellence and operational training so it has shrunk in terms of Navy but the reason we had not moved is that we we love the existence on the peninsula um, we don't like the driving up and down the road to get to the, the motorways and so on but um, it's it has a, a certain friendliness that we've always appreciated um, I've always loved the association of, Go of Gosport as the uh, victualling yard, if you like, for the Royal Navy. And it, it, it has a very, very great claim to fame in that re regard and should be proud of it. I mean, it's been supporting the Royal Navy for years. And, uh, you know, when you've served a long time in the Royal Navy, you, you're bound to appreciate the, the support that you get from the local people who are not necessarily military, but um, support the Navy. So uh, we're not going to move, we're going to stay here. We love it, we love the Stokes Bay. Um, I occasionally go down and try and pick up a bit of litter if I can remember when they're doing their run. Um, it's got some lovely people. Um, my son was um, uh, married, in, not in this church, but my daughter was in St Mary's. So, you know, we've, we've sort of been here a long time. We're going to stay here as long as we live. And we've even booked a plot in the Hasler <laughs> graveyard to where we got our ashes are going to be interred. So uh, I think we're here for... Spoke to Derek about that, have you? Yeah, it's all fixed. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I think you're right, Gosport is a lovely place and it does, I think, living on a peninsula, like you say, you have this a slightly different view. Yes. Um, I mean, I just still enjoy the, the ride or the walk round Stokes Bay. When I was a young, young officer, I used to run around there every morning, try and keep fit. And certainly when I was learning to be a diver in the Navy, I had to keep get fit. And I, I used to do that in the winter. And uh, it was still inspiring just to see the sea. And it's an amazing road, that when you think of it. You are within feet, you sometimes inches when it's coming over the top of the sea. And uh, it... it when, if the sea's in your blood, it's something to appreciate. Yeah, so you've done a really extensive naval career and you've seen conflict. What would you say are the most important things to you now as an older person who's obviously still active, but what would you say, what are the things that bring you happiness in your older years? Uh, there's only one answer, I'm afraid my family. Um, I'm very lucky. I've got a 49-year-old son who's married very happily. I've got a 47-year-old daughter who's married very happily. They've got, both couples have got two children, so I've got four grandchildren. And when I was 70, I took the whole lot of them. All ten of us went off to the Caribbean. Mammoth, all-inclusive holiday. And um, I'm still wondering whether to do something for my 75th, but I don't know, it may not happen. They, I wouldn't say that they're the reason I'm alive or anything, but gosh, they're fun. Grandchildren are fun. And we've we've all grown up together. I put a small swimming pool in the garden to, and all four of them have learned to swim in it. It, it d deliberately doesn't have a shallow end. You either swim or you sink. <laughs> and um, they can all dive and they swim like fish. So, um, so good memories. Very good memories. And um, it, it's one of the reasons, you know, I get up in the morning is, is for, the, for the family. That's lovely. Mm. And I think that, you, I think you speak for a lot of people when you say that. Good. Thank you, Peter. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Well, it's been fun meeting you, and uh, I've studied what you do with your life, and uh, I'm pretty full of admiration for <laughs> what you're up to after your illustrious career of 22, 23 years in the police and in the Navy and in the Air Force. And There's now time here yet you for are. something else. <laughs> well, you're, you're back in Gosport, so you're, you're, you've got to be a good girl. Thank you very much. <laughs>